Welcome all Bentley alumni, family, friends. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual event. My name is Bethany Lawler. I am the director in the Office of Alumni and Family Engagement. Before we get started, I just have a few things to go over. Uh, after this session, we'll be sending out an email with a recording and a survey to gather your feedback. Please keep an eye on your inboxes for that. Thank you, thank you for those. Thank you to those of who submitted questions in advance. Our speakers will address several of the pre-submitted questions during the panel discussion. But if you have additional questions arise as you're listening, please put them in the Q&A box and they will be considered for response during the question and answer session towards the end. Lastly, if you need te technical assistance, please use the chat box to speak with us directly. We will troubleshoot any issues the best we can. And I'm just gonna uh, kick us off with a brief introduction of our featured speakers. Our moderator today is John DeBello, Bentley class of 1981, MBA 1988. He is a Bentley adjunct lecturer teaching a course he designed on mergers and acquisitions. For 20 years, John was a general partner and the chief financial officer for TVM Capital, a transatlantic venture capital firm based in Munich that invested in early stage technology and life sciences companies and managed more than $1.5 billion in invested capital. That's a mouthful. Um, our panelists today are Eduard de Marmont, class of 2007, Fernando Moran Eserski, class of 2016, and Alejandro Zelaya, class of 2016. Eduard has over 10 years experience in the venture capital and startup space. He co-founded Arvoir Immersive Experiences, a storytelling experience studio and lab in 2017, and Velvet, a liquidity platform for late stage venture capital of emerging markets in 2021. He is a primetime Emmy award winner and acts as a strategic advisor through KPTL, a VC fund leading the way in ag tech, health tech, and gov tech investments in Latin America. Fernando is a serial entrepreneur with experience in venture, venture capital and ecosystem building in Latin America. He co-founded Seed Community in 2017 to bring together the most innovative companies and create an environment where collaboration is key across the region. He also co-founded SNBX, the first innovation center in El Salvador in 2020. Currently, Fernando is a managing partner at Energy Capital Ventures, a $20 million early stage fund focused on tech startups operating in Latin America, whose focus is to catalyze companies with clear solutions to real problems. Alejandro is a business professional involved in the first early stage venture capital fund in Guatemala, Invariantes Fund. He has extensive experience in the fields of sports management and international business administration, and is committed to developing the next generation of sustainable businesses in Central America. And Alejandro also currently serves in our Bentley Falcons of the last decade board. So thank you for that, Alejandro. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn the conversation over to John. So I thank you all for being here today. Well, thanks, Bethany, and uh, appreciate everybody attending today. We've got quite the quite the audience um, and quite the panel. Um, and as Bethany just put up this slide from PitchBook, uh, that's that's really shows you the power of the market. Uh, in Bethany's email to everybody, she showed that uh, there's almost fifteen billion dollars of capital that's gone into venture-backed startups in 2021. Um, almost 800 companies. So it's just an amazing development. And you can see the spike that started after 2017. And so it's an emerging market, but it's also a developing market that's got a lot of potential and a lot of good uh, professionals in it, like the three gentlemen on our panel. Um, and I think the, the way we should start is maybe to start about talking about the size of the market um, and maybe the size of the individual local markets that the gentlemen participate in. Maybe we can start with, with Alejandro um, and talking about your market, um, how large is the market, maybe talk about things like who your investors, how do you syndicate deals, et cetera. Maybe you can kick it off with that. Fantastic. Thank you, John, and a pleasure to be here, Edward and Fernando. Appreciate the invite. And uh, please, guys in the audience, ask any questions. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. Um, if you want, John, just you know, quick background on, on the size of the market of Latin America. It's important to recall uh, that we are a $5 trillion uh, of, of GDP market, right? Capital invested has increased tremendously in the past years. As you see, just from 2020 and back 2016, you know, it's almost a 6x 
uh, times increase. Uh, Brazil, and then we're one with me a lie. It's a top five market, you know, for companies like Netflix, uh, Uber, you know, um, back in 2020, $4.2 billion were deployed in venture capital or venture back deals, if you want to see it that way. But that's still a fraction, you know, of emerging uh, and other emerging markets, such as, as India, as you were saying, you know, so Latin America as a whole, as you were saying, I do believe it's an emerging market, uh, but we're getting there, you know, and it's becoming a developed market uh, as, you know, large number of opportunities of private opportunities are disrupting uh, key categories, you know, such in the finance or, or, or commerce space, you know. Then talking specifically about Guatemala, you know, and Fernando's not going to lie uh, with this and what I'm going to say, you know, I'd like to call Guatemala and then El Salvador as a, as a whole market, right? The Central American market, right? Um, it's been very tricky, John, to be honest. You know, our mission has always been to democratize the access to venture capital, uh, give our friends and family access to an asset class uh, that they're not very familiar with, you know, so it's been very challenging the past seven months that um, you know, since Invariantes was born to, to basically democratize this access to venture capital in, in, in our region, you know, uh, <clears throat> the majority of our LPs are high net worth individuals from our region that are super, super conservative, um, you know, in Central America, uh, we have a couple of venture capital funds that are doing really, really good things, you know, uh, just for us in Guatemala, if you combine the size of Invariantes fund number one, fund number two, and Invariantes fund number three that are, we're about to begin fundraising, um, overall, it's going to be a $50 million fund, right? So it's, it's um, you know, uh, quite challenging. I'm not saying it's, it's easy. It hasn't been easy or anything of the sort. Uh, but I like to call, you know, rather than local Guatemalan market as a whole, the Central American market, you know, and then how, you know, we share deal flow syndicate uh, deals with other funds. Um, given our hybrid model, at least for Invariantes, John, we also invest in other venture capital funds. So the 50% of our portfolio is allocated to other VC funds uh, that we collaborate with, you know, that we co-invest with, that we share deal flow with, you know. So um, nowadays, John, deal flow or syndicating deals or getting access to top tier deals, um, it's becoming very uh, popular, you know, bunch of platforms online that you can access deals and, and that type of stuff. But at the end, uh, as Naval says, we're building long-term relationships with long-term people uh, and building those relationships with those top-tier managers and funds that we really work closely with are the ones uh, that we syndicate and co-invest with. Well, thank you, Alejandro. That's, that's very interesting about, about your market and the broader market. Um, Fernando, you have any, have any comments on your experience in your markets? Yeah, definitely tagging along with Alejandro. Uh, so just to give context to the audience, Alejandro is in Guatemala, I'm in El Salvador. Uh, but at the end, Central America, even if you combine it, it, it's not even the size of Colombia. So for our fund specifically, which focuses in investing in early stage tech startups in Latin America, uh, most of our investment portfolio is located either in Mexico or Colombia or, or both. Uh, Brazil is obviously the, the biggest market in Latin America but it's a completely different ballpark game for, for us, uh, specifically uh, due to the network that we hold uh, both in Mexico and Colombia, which is pretty solid. Though we do have um, some companies that, for instance, grow their presence in, in Mexico, grow their presence in Colombia, and a third market uh, typically will be Brazil for, for a lot of them. Uh, that being said, uh, when it comes to our local market, there's not a lot of, of growth. We're only a 7 million uh, people population in El Salvador, expanding it to Central America. It's roughly around 50 million people, um, which again, it's, it's not even the size of Colombia. So if you're looking for scalability, if you're looking for growth multiples, you will have to go to the larger markets um, like Mexico holding 120 million people plus, right? Uh, that being said, the LP base, it is from Central America. Most of our LPs, um, investors, are from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Nicaragua, some from the United States. Uh, and like Alejandro was mentioning and tagging along his comments, a lot of this high net worth individuals don't necessarily have access to, to sexy tech deals, if you may, right? They're investing in traditional assets. They're investing in real estate. They're investing in and, and coffee beans, right? That's that's kind of like how they build a lot of their wealth. And that's how that has maintained through time. So uh, being a vehicle for them to open opportunities for this type of, of great startups that are out there, uh, that's really what drives us forward. Uh, of course, being technology a driving force for innovation and change for the region as a whole as well. Well, thanks. Um, 
And now if we shift to Edward, who's, you know, more of an entrepreneur, but also an angel and a facilitator. Um, and Edward, what's, what's your perspective on, on the market from many sides? You see it from the fundraising side as well as the deployment of capital side. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm, I'm in Brazil, right? So it's uh, as Alejandro and Fernando mentioned, it's a, it's a different ball game uh, in Brazil. It's more of a mature market. Um, investors and uh, limited partners for funds in Brazil are already a little more accustomed to this type of asset class. Uh, we've seen a reduction in interest rates over the past few years that have triggered people to have to seek more risk in order to deliver returns. And this has obviously shifted some of the capital into private equity and, and, and venture capital in general. So today we see already five to 10% of, um, of um, different um, you know, portfolios being invested already um, into this type of asset class. At Velvet, which is the, um, the startup I founded in September of last year, we've, um, we've managed to raise, uh, we just announced a few weeks ago, uh, $200 million for our investment platform. Um, and our LP base is basically Europe, US, and a little bit of Latin America. And we're focused on investing five to $10 million per uh, deal in growth and late stage companies in emerging markets. So um, this is um, basically my focus today uh, with, with the company. And, and um, thank you, Edward. I, I think it's, it, it's important to note a little bit of the context. So, you know, you guys are in emerging markets. Obviously, Edward, the Brazilian market is much more developed than your counterparts on the call today. But my old firm, TVM, where I was for 20 years, um, we were in an emerging market in Germany, say 35 or so years ago. And people were very reluctant to invest in venture. And our, our supporters were corporate, not pension funds, not insurance companies, not banks, um, and some rich private individuals. And our first fund was only 50 million and it, we grew to a 1.5 billion total management size. And so you, you see the size of your funds, Alejandro and Fernando, you're gonna get there. It takes time, mm -hmm. right? It takes time for the ecosystem to get comfortable to deploy capital in that way and to see the successes, right? Um, so have patience. Uh, you guys are off to a really great start as at, at, at an amazing amount of money you've raised. Edward, it's, it's uh, really commendable. Um, well, Edward is in a different, completely ballpark. Every time right. I talk to Edward, yeah, yeah, right. you know, I want to bring him on board for my own fundraising process. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you're taking a very similar uh, approach to say what I saw at TVM because you guys talked about, Alejandro, investing in other venture funds, right? You talked about, uh, and, and Fernando, you talked about investing in startups outside of your home country market because the startups weren't there. Very similar to our experience in Europe. We invested in US venture funds to learn the business. We started to invest in some US startups, right? And so to, to, to talk to that, can you talk a little bit about the startups themselves and you know what kind of things you've been involved with, um, how you syndicate those deals with local or other Latin American or maybe non-Latin American investors? And maybe a little bit about what the entrepreneurs are like, what kind of experience they have, um, and, and you have to bring in kind of people from outside to, to help nurture them and mentor them. I maybe start with you, Alejandro. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I would say, uh, John, out of the 11 venture capital funds that we have invested, you know, nine of them are in the U.S., two of them are in Latin America, both of them are, are in Mexico. Um, then, you know, I would say roughly 75, 70% 70 of our portfolio of our direct tickets and startups, John, um, are in the US, then 25% uh, 
um, in Latin America. We're growing though at a personal level, you know, my general partners, partners and myself, you know, we have invested personally in multiple Latin American deals as well. Actually, our three last deals out of Invariantes on number two uh, were Latin American based companies, one digital wallet in Colombia, um, one last mile aggregator in Ecuador, and then another fintech in Mexico, you know? So again, you know, it's, it's growing. How are we syndicating this? Um, venture capital, John, it's a very uh, comfortable and very friendly ecosystem. If you want to see it that way, you know, it's not that it used to be back then, you know, in Wall Street and, you know, I'm syndicating this deal or I'm leading this round, you know, I'm not going to share that memo with you, nothing of the sort, you know, um, all the other BC funds that we collaborate with in the US or other BC funds that we work closely with in the region, uh, you know, we have a really, really good relationship that has turned even into a, a friendship relationship, if you want to see it that way, you know, because at the end, you know, we want to succeed all together, uh, not only in our personal interests, you know, in our numbers for our fund, our own limited partners who are the investors for you guys that don't know limited partners is the same as investors. Um, but for the overall ecosystem, right? You know, so as, as you're saying, you know, Latam is growing. It, there's there's no doubt about it, right? You know, it's just growing, you know, this 2021, uh, the money pool was more than the six past years combined, you know, that's just an incredible stat right there. Um, but still, you know, in terms of founders, what happens, John, and, and this is my personal opinion, is that they are first time founders, you know, and founders that are trying to solve the extra white problem of another country in the region, right? So many founders, you know, when they pitch you, when they're talking to you, they're like, hey, I want to be the LinkedIn of Guatemala, or I want to be the Uber of Central America, or I want to be the X or Y of Brazil, or I want to be the X or Y of Ecuador, you know, and they need to understand the, the venture capital culture, right? You know, for Fernando, for myself and other VC funds in the region, you know, we need your company to grow up to a point, you know, that you become so much attractive or even bigger, either to go to a public market, right? Or get acquired by someone else, you know? And that for a first time founder, uh, an unexperienced founder, you know, it's, it's typically a rough patch, right? Um, for example, we have companies <coughs> out of Invariantes fund number two, we have one company, uh, the founder, you know, is a two times founder, two exits, uh, and with the money that he made in the second exit, well, he's playing some type of role as, as Edward is, is doing, you know, as an angel investor, and he also got an exit as an angel investor. So imagine, you know, that's the type of founder that you want to address. That's the type of founder uh, that you want to work closely with, right? Well, thanks. That's that's very compelling story about the how it, it is so difficult when the market's new to find people who have that relevant experience to start and run a business. Um, Fernando, any thoughts about, about the stuff? Yeah, I, I, I like to see it as cycles at the end. It, it really comes down to closing the full cycle from starting, growing, and selling your company. And until you have that full cycle, then you actually complete the whole journey of, of the entrepreneur, so to speak. Uh, in El Salvador, it's, you know, it's been hard to see that kind of uh, unravel throughout the years. We've just seen the first startup have its exit at, at around $150 million, which essentially closes that cycle. Like Alejandro says, now what you're seeing is a lot of the business unit leaders that were running this multinational company essentially are starting their own startups. Uh, the founders got a big liquidity event, so they're doing another project. Uh, and, and that's really where the wheel starts turning. Uh, and that's where, where I've been, you know, essentially trying to work the, the grounds up for the last maybe eight years building ecosystems. Uh, but you needed this external event to, to kind of ignite everything and set it into motion. So that's really interesting to see finally in Central America. Obviously, in Latin America, you're seeing um, companies like Nubank, for instance, come with a massive IPO. Um, and, and you're going to start seeing more of these companies, essentially, uh, you're going to see a lot of these companies essentially create the, the, the future of the ecosystem, create the future of Latin America, but it just takes time, right? And we have to be reasonable that America started 30 years ago, Latin America has recently just started with this ball game. Uh, so the time will be a little bit uh, further delayed. Uh, but it's it's exciting to see that happening um, in the last two three years. Ed, Edward, as as a, a guy who started some companies and been an angel for some companies, what 
what are your thoughts on how how it is to be from that side, from the the founder startup side, from the developing the business side? Yeah. So what we see in 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 our region is um, that most of the founders are usually educated or have had work experience abroad. Um, and they've seen the taste of technology uh, and worked at, as an operator in a technology company in a different place uh, before starting their own. So we're, we're strong believers that the operators of today are the founders of tomorrow. And, um, and that's what we've been seeing recurringly um, in, in, in Brazil, at least. Today, Brazil has about 20 unicorns. Uh, but if you look at three years ago, we had only two, right? So that number has been increasing tremendously year over year. Um, and um, out of those unicorns, 50% are first-time founders, um, and the other 50% are founders that have already started and exited previous companies before. So, um, so I, I'd say there's no, no single rule um, as to whether you're going to succeed into fulfilling that whole cycle. Uh, we've seen it both ways. Um, obviously, becoming a founder today and raising capital today in a Latin American country is much different than doing that three, five, or, or, or more years ago when, it was, when capital was extremely limited. Nowadays, you have an abundance of capital um, that is seeking uh, uh, companies that are not only replicating models that exist abroad, but also that are bringing innovation from within um, so Nubank is a great example, right? So Nubank um, went out to become the largest digital bank in the world with Brazilian talent initially. Um, and they understood that, you know, they could do that using talent acquisition, talent retention from the region. Right? And, and they were the big success case and first success case to really deliver on that and a great inspiration for us all. Um, so yeah, these are my, my two cents on that. So if you, Edward, if we stick with you, um, and you, you talk, talk a bit about your relationship in raising money for the companies that you were involved with at the entrepreneur level, dealing with, with guys like Alejandro and Fernando, what, where did you seek out capital? How did you seek out capital? Was it local? Was it probably outside the region because of the, you know, immature markets probably at the beginning? So, so I'm, um, I'm a third time uh, founder now, founder, founding team member. And my first company, I came in as a founding team member, it was a data company called Majoritas. And at that point, um, this was nine years ago, um, we, there was no capital in Latin America uh, to be raised for this sort of um, uh, venture. And so all of the capital came from abroad. So it was mostly funds from, you know, uh, Silicon Valley or, or Western Europe uh, that had funded the company. And then the company exited um, a portion of its stake uh, to a big uh, technology company in the U.S. Um, then the second time around when I founded Arvory, which is a, a immersive technology studio, again, um, uh, there, there was already capital in the region uh, and we raised our first um, check, our seed stage check from a local Brazilian venture fund initially. But then uh, since it was a very frontier technology uh, um, a company, there was very limited capital for this sort of, of, of company in the market. Obviously, nowadays with the metaverse and so forth, uh, you know, you just lift your finger and you can raise some money for the metaverse and Web3 and all of that. Um, but back in 2017, uh, this wasn't really the reality. So for the future rounds, um, we had to raise money uh, from abroad. What we see in Brazil is that um, we, there, it, back in 2017, 2018, and even 2019, there was uh, uh, quite a bit of capital for early stage. Uh, but then as you grew into more of a growth stage, uh, scale up uh, type of scenario, then you had to reach for capital abroad, right? Um, nowadays in Brazil, you know, all of the big 
growth funds are already present. So you have SoftBank, Tiger, Riverwood, QED, um, and, and, and all these folks, Andreessen Horowitz, are pretty active in the region. So nowadays, you could go from seed to IPO without looking for capital outside of Brazil. Um, so, which is what we've done with my new um, venture, Velvet. Um, we've raised money uh, locally and also from, from abroad. Well, thanks. I, I think it's interesting. Brazil seems to be for the region, kind of the, the model that, that you guys, uh, Alejandro and Fernando could, uh, and Alejandro and Fernando could, could look to following. So, Fernando, given that, when you look at a company um, and you look at an entrepreneur like a, a future Edward, um, how, how do you assess, um, you know, what, what are the key things you look at? What are the key things that your decision points as far as making investments in the company? Because it's quite risky when it's maybe a first time entrepreneur or a, a, a market where you maybe are uncertain about raising enough money. So what, what kind yeah, of... It's, it's interesting, especially coming in at very early stage. Um, so Edward did mention a lot of the big funds coming into Latin America. And I just wanted to touch a bit on that. Uh, first, it has um, created higher valuations for Series A, which essentially become more expensive for funds like our size, which is uh, 20 million compared to, you know, these funds that are a billion, a billion plus playing in the same arena. Um, so you, you are seeing a shift of uh, higher valuations driven by the excess of capital, driven by um, this international funds coming in. Uh, so we're kind of shifting pre-Series A in, you know, in investing in, in our thesis, and it really does come down to the founder, right? It's the conviction that you have that the right team behind the idea or the problem being solved will have the driving force to get that done and get that fast to market uh, timely uh, with a path to profitability. Uh, essentially, there's not a lot of data out there in this early stage to, to actually assess if that's moving in the right direction. Uh, we typically invest in companies that already have some sort of traction um, you know, in, in, in revenue, some sort of, of traction in users, and that gives us a parameter, but at the end, it has to be a, a high conviction on the founder uh, and, and to your question, John, on first time founders, um, you know, we do have a conviction chart, so to speak, uh, uh, on our, you know, first interview or first meeting with the founders and two time founders automatically is, you know, kind of like a gold star, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really hard to find, uh, especially in very premature markets like, like Central America, uh, but you are seeing them and there are great uh, founders out there. Uh, and you just have to be patient, right? Because it, it becomes a fuss as well. You're, you're trying to invest in everything. Uh, we saw over 400 deals just last year alone. We ended up investing in five. Um, and, and you just have to be really patient and, and stick true to your principles, stick true to your convictions. Uh, and, and honestly, it, it also has to do with, with a relationship building, right? We're, we're starting at a very early stage uh, and we're going to hopefully continue this relationship for the next next eight years at least, which is the life of the fund. Uh, so might as well, uh, you know, have have a, a good connection with the founder as well, right? Because you'll be having regular calls. Uh, they'll be calling for help. They'll be calling for, for advice. Um, so just have that human touch to the process. Uh, for me, it's the most important, especially at the stage that we're in. Yeah, that's, you know, as, as, um, in, in my firm as, as the CFO guy, surrounded by, you know, scientists and um, engineers, right? Investing in tech and life science, the people are always the most important because you can look at that person and you can tell, do I have faith in this person? I can work with this person. Um, it, a couple of uh, audience members have asked questions um, that I think are relevant at this point. One is, um, what is your bite size? What is the average investment size that you'll put in? Uh, and maybe you can talk about the total company raise. You know, what would you take? What would the total round size be on average? And how much would you put in a company in total uh, over its life cycle before you exit? That's a, that's a good question and, and appreciate that from the audience. And just recalling on what Fernando was saying about, about the team, uh, 
I'm currently guys reading this book for in the audience. If you want to read it, it's called the it's called The Cold Start Problem by Andrew Chen, his eternal partner in Christian Horowitz. And he can state enough the importance of the team in early stages. So uh, thanks for addressing that, Fernando. So for us in Invariantes, uh, Professor Develo, our average ticket size ranges between 100K and 200K, right? That's our, uh, that has been our average initial ticket sizes for direct deals. Um, however, as you know, we have this hybrid model that we also invest in other venture capital funds. And those ticket sizes range between $1 million and $2 million, right? Um, however, you know, and something that we do believe strongly is to increase in our position in those companies that are your winners, right, after 18, 24 months. So we do reserve roughly 15%, 20% of our overall portfolio fund size for full-on investments, you know, as uh, Edward was saying, you know, for example, in a seed round, you know, that they're raising, I don't know, let's say $1.5 million at a valuation of $12 million. Well, you know what, 100K ticket would make sense, right? And then we measure KPIs in terms of retention, in terms of growth, uh, in terms of revenue, uh, if they were able to penetrate other markets or not, you know, unit economics, if they're reaching certain profitability. And then we come in with another ticket, right? With a bigger ticket, you know, let's say a 350K ticket or a 400K ticket um, in order to increase our, pos our position up to 500K in five or six companies, you know, that we believe have the potential to return the, the entire fund. Um, thank you, Alejandro. Fernando, what is what is your relevant average? Yeah, uh, so, so it's interesting uh, because we, we have a different strategy than than in Bariantes, uh, and 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 that's the interesting of the, the industry as well, right? You have rolling funds, uh, you have you know all this type of, of funds that are now even the legacy funds that they're not exiting after 10 years and liquidating the portfolio. In our case, what we do is uh, we leave 60% of the initial 20 million to do uh, first time tickets from a hundred thousand to five hundred thousand uh, dollars. That being said, we're building out the portfolio of around 25 companies with that and then we're leaving the 40 percent of of the follow-on of, of the total of the fund to do follow-on investments up to a million and a half, right? Uh, in our case, we don't invest in other funds. we do uh, directly uh, straight investments. Uh, though we have a feeder fund that that helps us with really, really early stage startups that are not in our radar, and it's actually based in Brazil. So that's the only investment we've done in another fund. Uh, it's called Latitude. It's not a strategy to, to be funds of funds. It's more of so getting these great deals very early on uh, in a market that we don't necessarily have a penetration in. Uh, so this gives us a, a nice visibility to, to the region, right? And one of the, and, and this is always tough in early stage, one of, the, one of the audience members says, how do you value these companies? You don't, right? that's why you invest in a safe. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but, but you need to, you need to figure it out. What is your, what is your, I mean, obviously you're going to look at what peers are raising and all that, but when you go at this, you're looking at all the standard credit, the market size, the competition, yeah. the people. What about that number? What about that valuation number? How do you I mean, that? honestly, that that's why uh, typically since we're getting pre-Series A, we're investing in, in, in a vehicle or, or in a mechanism called SAFE, which is Simple Agreement for Future Equity, right? Yeah. So what you're doing is essentially you're putting a cap, a value cap on that valuation, and you're waiting until this startup raises a Series A, so then you can convert to, to equity. Um, so the valuation is given by the market, which essentially, once they hit the Series A, they do have more traction there. They do have more data to put that value dollar on the company's valuation. Uh, and, and honestly, it's a negotiation game, right? I'm worth six. Who says I'm worth six millions? You know, I think you're worth three. And, and off you go from that. Uh, last year, we were seeing companies with 300,000 ARR. Uh, being valued at around seven to eight million dollars, now you're seeing them valued at fifteen million dollars. How come? Just because they're in excess of capital, and and they know they can get a higher valuation because there's more players with deeper pockets willing to sign bigger checks. Um, so it really just comes down to a negotiation. It's it's a you know it's it's 
it's it's very hard to decipher what you're worth when there's not really much there except just a projection of expectations of what your technology and your team is willing to do or, or capable of doing in a market, right? Um, and do you do you go through the exercise of preparing a discounted cash flow? Do you go through modeling um, on what the future rounds will be, what the exit will be? How, how does that all work? Yeah. Uh, so essentially, you're you're structuring, you know, based on 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 the data they're they're providing as well, right? Because that's that's another thing. Uh, you'll have access to data, but that's data just based on projections, maybe on a on a ten year runway, but uh, they probably have a year or two years of operations, and things switch super super fast. And an Excel, um, you know, if I would have run my Excels, I, I would have probably have a lot more money based on, on those Excel projections than I do now, because you don't take account externalities and a lot of factors that are beyond the control of, you know, of a simple Excel in that regard. So personally, um, and, and kind of looping back to the original statement, it's really putting your trust on the founder at this stage, at least that, that Inogen Capital is, is going into. Right? We're, we're doing pre-series A. Uh, you're betting essentially on the team and again the numbers will always look nice when when you present it in an excel especially if you're presenting to investors uh and i've learned not to rely too much on those excels at, a, at an early stage and rely more on on the founder themselves um and bet on that you know you, you you're really betting on the future of, of a region uh the technology has to be solid i i i'm more concerned on how the technology can be scalable for instance as opposed to you know what what the discounted cash flow of your Excel tells me because that doesn't really mean anything um, that just means how optimistic you are about your numbers, but and then adding on that, Professor um, the Bell and also you know on what Ether touched on you know this um, international funds the soft banks the co tools the QEDs you know that they're already you know building humongous VC funds to invest early stage in Latin America you know at least for us. Um, in Indogen Capital and, and, and in Variantes, you know, it's tough for us to determine what a company is worth once that founder has found a lead investor. And by lead investor, I mean, you know, someone that's willing to put 70% of that round, you know, at certain valuation, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's become a little bit complicated for, for us uh, to find those early stage deals before this big, big funds come in. Uh, just because, you know, that term of lead investor is one that <clears throat> we hear a lot, you know, uh, founders are trying to find that lead investor, you know, that QED, that CO2, uh, that Tiger Global, that SoftBank, that whatever, you know, uh, that basically on paper, right, guys, because at the end, this is, this is on paper, uh, they're going to say, hey, your company, you know, you're two months being born and you're 25 million, that's your worth, and then you're like, Jesus, you know, how can this, this be possible, and then you're raising, you know, three and a half million dollar funds, you know, and out of those three and a half million dollar funds, you know, three are going to operations. So now this company has a CFO, a CTO, a CIO, uh, a CEO, something, and, and it's becoming quite um, incredible to see, you know, how this external players and international players are just pouring capital, you know, in early stage companies, just bumping valuations in something that uh, I don't think it's uh, justifiable to, to be honest. And, and Edward, um, you're playing in the angel market, maybe one step down. Um, can you give us some perspective on that? You may have these convertibles that Fernando was talking about. How, how do you look at investing in valuing companies at that even earlier stage than the guys are talking about? Yeah, so there, there's two, two approaches. At Velvet, we only do growth and late stage. So it's yeah. uh, only companies that are um, Three hundred million dollars valuation and above, uh, and that's where we do five to ten million dollar investments per company, um, and we'll probably do you know up to thirty uh, over the period of three years um, in those companies. Always buying, uh, giving liquidity to current and past employees, um, and for them to take that money and become founders themselves. Right, so um, that's that's where we operate. Um, I'm, we're going to be announcing in the next few weeks a, a, a pre-seed stage fund um, that is basically replicating what I've been doing as an angel investor for, for a while. Um, we're going to up the tickets a little bit. So I've been doing investments at you know 20 to 50K 
um, uh, uh, check sizes uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, but now with this fund, I'm going to concentrate everything there. We're going to do checks anywhere from 100 to 500K, more or less. Uh, so similar to what Alejandro and Fernando are doing. Um, and the idea is, uh, you know, the, as they mentioned, right, investing at that stage is really reliable, uh, re rely on the founders and the team, um, but also with 100 to 500 K checks, we can't expect to be leading rounds. So it's really piggybacking on whoever the quality of that lead investor is gonna be. Um, and you know, there's the usual suspects, right? Uh, whether they're big local funds or uh, um, foreign funds that have you know, uh, some appetite for, for the market in Brazil um, will be followers in those rounds with this type of check size. Um, and, and, and that's the filter that we, we do. We have an investment committee. So we, uh, we have a few folks from inside of the company and also from outside that help us analyze deals on a, on a case by case, uh, uh, deal. And, um, and that's how we, we do our, our process. Okay. Um, why don't we why don't we shift a bit because I'm looking at the time here and maybe Alejandro you can talk uh, to us as well as the other guys maybe you start on what kinds of industry niches are you looking at what kind you know, what's what's exciting to you what's what's prominent in the market what's developing fantastic so uh, for us Professor Debello and Mariantes we're sector agnostic um, mm. or web page you know we have companies. Uh, ranging from cloud kitchens, fintechs, logistics, more deep technologies. But in Latin America, I would say there are three verticals um, that are the hot markets or the hot verticals, the hot industries, if you want to see it that way. Uh, number one, fintech. Fintech continues to be uh, the most predominant vertical uh, and the most um, beautiful that we receive from Latin American companies, right? Uh, we mentioned New Bank. Uh, example, you know, Confio, for example, in Mexico, that just turned into a unicorn uh, a couple of months ago. Then I would say logistics and delivery as well, Professor Develo, um, you know, Rappi being one of them. Uh, of course, uh, 99 Minutos, which is also uh, in that same vertical, you know, it raised a relatively huge round this past week. Um, and lastly, I would say e-commerce and marketplaces, you know, um, these three, by far in Latin, Latin America, I think are the most predominant uh, in e-commerce. For example, I can bring up Merama, if you want to see it that way, that also became a unicorn, you know. Um, so, you know, those, those three, between e-commerce, logistics, delivery, and fintech, definitely those three. And, okay. and maybe just tagging along what Alejandro is saying, I would, I would like to add cybersecurity because we're, we're mm -hmm. looking at rapid growth in digitalization across Latin America which is faster than we're actually protecting our data, right? So, so you're seeing a lot of voids in the market. You're seeing a lot of data breach. Um, and as a fund, as Inogen, we are looking very heavily into cybersecurity. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of solutions out there, um, maybe comparable to, to the markets Alejandro just mentioned, uh, but it should be a priority for the region uh, in order to grow fast digitally, but grow safe as well. That's, that's a good one for mental health as well. You know, mental health, it's, it's, it's a hot market uh, nowadays in Latin America. Obviously, you know, COVID accelerated certain trends, you know, um, online therapy uh, and, and, and mental health has also been one that we received a lot of deals on a bunch of super early stage funds are investing in mental health um, companies, which it's, in my opinion, pretty, uh, pretty fantastic, to be honest. Yeah, in, in our case here, if I, if I can add, um, yeah. You know, fintech obviously is number one. Um, you know, Angela Strange at A16Z and Andreessen Horowitz says that every company in the future will become a fintech event eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's that's uh, why it's by far the number one. For us, we're very interested in crypto and Web three. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, seeing a lot of uh, uh, in Latin America in general, and I, and I'm surprised. You guys didn't mention crypto huh? because when you look at El Salvador becoming a crypto country, I mean, I, I would imagine that it's um, it's 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 more and more um, uh, an, an important part of your 
of your analysis. Uh, but for us here, um, you know, crypto, very important, uh, blockchain technology in general, um, uh, very interesting. We're looking at a lot of companies in that. Um, cannabis is something interesting, medicinal cannabis. Um, uh, the law is about to be passed in Brazil. So um, there are a few marketplaces and, and, and companies in that sector that we're gonna see booming in the next few years. Uh, Brazil is a huge market for that, obviously. Um, not as excited about um, uh, delivery uh, apps. Um, I think you know it's a high cost of acquisition, and uh, we're now with the markets that are extremely turbulent in public markets. Um, and a lot of the co those companies at the late stage we're looking to IPO within the next six months. And um, now it's it's a suicide mission to come out to an IPO in the next year. So those companies are going to have to raise more cash, maybe face some down rounds. Um, I'm, you know, intrigued to see what's going to happen there. Um, but yeah, these are are some of what we're we're interested to hear. Okay. Um, I what I didn't hear, uh, other than a little bit on mental health, was was broader life sciences. Is that at all any of you guys, Alejandro, Fernando, or Edward? Any? And I don't know. That's a very specific. Uh, you need you know need real you know kind of on the bench experience with that. It's very complex and very expensive. But any thoughts on a developing biotech? Um, we'll leave that to Boston probably. We just don't have the <laughs> exactly exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure we'll have you know a similar answer here, Professor Tello. But uh, it's not as developed uh, yeah. as you might think. And personally, I believe there's one specific reason, and tagging a lot with what Fernando said in Boston is that universities across Latin America, they don't have many uh, biotech programs, you know? If you look yep. at Israel or if you look at Boston, Boston being, you know, probably the capital of the world in terms of, of biotech and, you know, like just huge um, life sciences funds um, being in Boston, operating in Boston and so on. Israel being an emerging market uh, in that same space, you know, I think one of the main reasons is that universities across Latin America, they don't have many programs for life sciences, uh, biotech, and, and, and so on. You know, I do believe, you know, uh, in order to increase that vertical or for that vertical to, to take the next step, if you want to see it that way, it's got to start in the schools. That's good to you. Edward, probably similar thoughts on that? Yeah, very little life sciences biotech yeah. here. Um, there, there's um, uh, some med tech, Right, insure tech, uh, which is different than mid tech, obviously, but is is becoming. Uh, I think that looking at, at fintech in general, right? I think insurance is the next frontier that is being disrupted. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure that's the same way in Mexico and other Central American countries. Um, but in terms of medical technology, biotech, this is still uh, uh, not in the in the immediate horizon. I say prop tech. In real estate is also something intriguing uh, that we're looking closely at here as well, but still very uh, uh, um, nimble as of now. Um, just to shift gears, um, can you talk a little bit about corporate governance? Um, you know, we're in the United States, we're accustomed to investing in corporations, uh, many times Delaware corporations, people are very comfortable with that. Um, Maybe Edward, start with you at the sure, you sure. set up companies, uh, the US style corporations, preferred stock, is that how it works? Or? Yeah, so so over here, um, it's if, if you're gonna go the VC round uh, as a founder, you most likely are gonna do what they call a, a sandwich structure, mm -hmm. which is a Cayman holding with a Delaware pass through that invests in the uh, local company in Brazil. Um, and so the holding remains in the Cayman Islands or BVI or the Bahamas or UK. Uh, but usually there's that holding structure. And then there's the Delaware pass-through for tax reasons so that we can raise money in, in and out of the US without any large withholding tax implications. Um, and then all of that gets invested and channeled into the, uh, the local structures. So that's how governance is, 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 is made. Usually you have the common and founder stock uh, initially, and then you get diluted uh, with preferred stock issuance to the different investors that come in uh, uh, through the different rounds, right? 
Um, there's usually a board of directors uh, that makes um, you know the decisions uh, of the, of the companies, the big decisions of the companies. Um, and as you grow uh, further and closer to an IPO, usually the IPO is uh, happens in the U.S. So it's whether it's New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq, this is the route that you go as a LATAM unicorn would would grow into. So, so in your, just to finish that point, for the companies themselves, a Brazilian company would be like a U.S. corporation with the typical typical governance. Right, that's correct. And how about you guys, uh, Alejandro or Fernando? What no, I, th I think uh, Edward is is completely on point there. We're actually seeing our you know, our portfolio companies, they're all structured in the US, right? Mm. The only difference is that the founders are from Latin America, but the structure is usually in Delaware uh, or, or kind of like the sandwich uh, concept that Edward mentioned. Even our fund is, is a Delaware fund, right? Our, our custodian bank is Silicon Valley Bank. You know, our, our legal structure is US based because we don't have that infrastructure legally in Latin America. And you have a big risk of, of currency devaluation there's there's a lot of externalities um, that, that take into account and affect and creates a, a higher risk for investors to even consider investing or putting their money straight in Latin America. So might as well, you know, take it up to the states, create a structure there where everybody feels comfortable, uh, have the money invested in the United States. And from from that account, you know, diverted back to the startups, which also have their accounts in the United States. So so money is, is really just flowing up, um, essentially. Yeah. And Alejandro, thoughts, uh, is it similar? Super similar. Nothing else to add to what Edward and, and Fernando said, you know, uh, even just if you want to add something Professor Dibello, it's it's even the political risk that we suffer in Latin America, right? You know, governance changing every four years in the majority of countries in, in, in Latin America. Um, so again, you know, our fund, for example, is domiciled in uh, Cayman Islands. Uh, and I said what we're saying, you know, the companies uh, that we are, you know, Proud investors in, in Latin America, most of them are either C corps, LLCs uh, that are based in in Delaware or or any other you know BBI Cayman and take it from there. Okay, well there are, there are so many things we could talk about in this this little panel, but I want to be sensitive to timing and also to the fact that I believe Bethany we might have a couple of um, audience questions. Yes. Thank you all. Um, it, we do have a few more minutes, so I will ask um, one of the audience questions we have now. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat right now. Um, but we did have one from Maria, uh, who has personal experience. She's from Colombia, um, originally from Colombia, and um, in this space. And she asked, have any of you invested in startups based in Latin America with female founders? Um, I guess she, in her personal experience, she had to find investors in the U.S. and it was hard to find them locally. So, oh, that's that's a really good question, and and, and let me take it from uh, here. You know, one of our last companies, you know, actually a Colombian-based company, um, one of the co-founders, she's a female founder. You know, and uh, if you go to Mexico, there's a fintech called Oyster. Um, you know, also both females are co-founders. Um, you know, for example, QED, the pure fintech fund, as Edward was saying, uh, based in uh, San Francisco, but investing only in fintech companies across Latin America. Uh, the principal over there is actually from Guatemala, female founder. Uh, so it's it's increasing and it's taking a lot of, of um, enthusiasm, you know, for foreign funds and even us local funds to, to somehow diversify our portfolio and invest in, in, in female founders as well. So absolutely. And Maria is actually from Guatemala, Alejandro. So I, okay. I believe she's. We should start her next time. Yeah. You know, send me an email. Hopefully, you know, after Bethany can put the emails or link this, and we can uh, further connect. That will be fantastic. And I will be sending out an email afterwards. Um, if you missed it at the beginning, I will be sending out a follow-up email with the recording, our survey, and all of our uh, panelists' information after this. So feel free to connect with anyone on any of these topics that we talked about today. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Andres asks, what channels are available for U.S. domiciled investors to invest within your within your platforms?
So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming uh, platforms, he's, he's referring to the funds, um, which would be, you know, essentially all of them, right? I think we're all, I don't know, Alejandro, where, where you're domiciled, but we're domiciled in the US. And even if, if you're not, it's, it's, it can always, um, you know, work at the end. It is like, like we were saying earlier, it is a fund based out of El Salvador with operations in Mexico and Colombia, uh, but structured in the United States. Right, um, and that's the the standard of the industry. I would I would say is 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 a Delaware fund, and that's typically what you'll see with any other uh, Latin American funds. Uh, the Mexican funds are structured very similar. Um, Colombian funds are structured very similar, and at the end, uh, what we seek is to have a place where the laws are respected, where the the investor feels safe that their money will have um you know safeguarded and and we try to add those filters along our our our, our portfolio uh, by having third-party regulators you know we're regulated by the sec so we have to follow uh certain rules as well and um and and we can't bypass that so it's very important for us to to be domiciled in a place where we feel safe that the money is safe and that we're making right decisions uh, regarding regarding the investment so um I, I would say any of the funds, um, most likely of Latin America, uh, would be safe for a U.S. domiciled investor. Yeah, if I can add something on my side for Velvet, uh, we are an investment platform, so uh, we'll be opening it in the next few weeks. Um, and you know, whoever is interested can pre-register on our on our uh, website uh, of our platform, and then we'll be opening starting at twenty k. Um, anybody from anywhere in the world can go in and invest in any of the companies that we have on our platform that we've already acquired the shares. Um, so it's a way of, of democratizing access to late stage pre IPO opportunities in emerging markets, right? So whoever is interested can uh, log into velvet.io and access uh, and pre register to access uh, this sort of opportunity. Uh, I think we only have a couple of minutes left, so I think it uh, would be great if we had maybe each of you go around and say one thing to take away from this session, um, you know, to consider when thinking about VC in Latin America, just a quick snippet um, so that we can leave our audience with uh, key takeaways from today. Alejandro, if you want to start. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, first of all, um, you know, Bethany and Professor DiBello, thanks for putting this event together. Uh, I hope the audience, uh, you know, you guys take some takeaways. Please feel free to reach out, you know, to our emails, uh, to our LinkedIn profiles, you know. And if I take something out of this conversation, you know, listening to Edward, you know, just the access that he's had, Fernando, uh, doing very similar stuff that what we're doing is that, you know, Latin America, as, as, as I said at the beginning, you know, it's a developing market. Uh, we need to be patient, you know, in terms, for example, and mostly in the exit landscape, you know, uh, but it's definitely a market that we should all be very proud of, that we should all be very um, into it, because uh, I think it's, it's going to grow, you know, eventually up to a point to become, you know, one of the most attractive uh, VC ecosystems and markets in the, in the world. Fernando? Sure. Um, I, I just want to say it's it's a really exciting time. I think Latin America is going through a massive transformation digitally. Uh, internet penetration is there. The, the amount of smartphones is there. Uh, the need and desire to to use technology as a, as a way to improve social conditions is there. And reflecting back on, on my last seven years uh, since graduating Bentley, when I started working with, with the entrepreneurship ecosystem, um, it's really exciting to see this inflection point, maybe in the last two years, have this dramatic shift in Latin America being a focus of interest for the rest of the world. Actually, uh, Latin America was the highest uh, growth uh, in, in the VC market uh, from around the world last year. So, so compared to Europe, compared to the United States, um, compared to Asia, Latin America was, was the highest growing uh, in the region. So it is a very, very exciting, um, just acknowledging some of the questions they're, they're talking about Bentley alums. And if, you know, we're investing in founders, I think there's a lot of cash out there right now. I don't know how long that will last. Uh, but if you are looking to start an idea, I would say 
today is probably the best time to start a startup uh, based on just the amount of, of excess of cash. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, we can see the results of that and uh, carry on the success of Latin America, which has so much to offer for the world. And I'm very excited to, to be a small part of, of this big, big uh, concept, which is just changing the world through innovation and entrepreneurship and startups. So uh, very grateful for the experience. Thanks, uh, Professor DiBello, uh, Bethany as well, and, and the Bentley community. And, you know, we're, we're at the service of, of startups and entrepreneurs, and, and that's the reason of being for, for any VC. So any, any concepts that you guys would like to just chat about or you know, reach out, the emails will be sent out, and, and we're at the disposal to keep helping and keep changing the world. Edward? Um, great. So j just a few final thoughts. Um, I think that um, the the world's biggest problems still have to be resolved in emerging markets and LATAM is a big part of that. Um, so when you look at you know, investing in uh, more mature markets like the US or Western Europe or some parts of, of Asia, um, the new companies that are coming out are iterations of things that have already been solved. Um, but when you look at Latin America and uh, Southeast Asia, India, Africa, um, the founders of today are uh, bringing solutions to problems that impact the entire world. So I think that as we look at a as as a Generation Z coming as the new big consumers and big investors in markets, um, we're going to see a big shift into um, bigger tech companies coming from emerging regions like LATAM. So I think we're really at the very beginning today. Um, obviously there are nuances in the market and volatility and so forth, but um, it's, it's gonna keep growing faster and faster as we go. Um, so hopefully we can you know, organize a next panel together in a year or two from now, and then the reality will be completely different already. And we'll, we'll uh, you know, have some more Bentley founders that we've supported. Um, just answering this question as well, um, you know, I, I would personally love to be more involved with the Bentley community. This is the first time in 10 years since I've graduated, over 10 years now, um, uh, that I've engaged with Bentley. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy uh, and I hope that I can do this more. So if anybody ever wants to reach out, I'll be more than happy to, uh, uh, to take some time to talk to whoever is interested. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Edward. Uh, John, what? Any last thoughts? Yeah, I tell you, if if uh, if these three guys are any indication, the future for Latin American venture capital and you know entrepreneurship is very bright. So, thank you, young men. You're representing Bentley very well, and uh, continued good success. Very well said, and um, I want to thank all of our panelists um, for being here today, for taking the time out to bring this amazing presentation to our community. And thank you to all of our community members who joined in and engaged with us today. And um, we hope to see you soon at a future Bentley event. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.